felt like a party walking in here, didn't it? Anybody have trouble finding parking or finding the check-in or any of that? It's been kind of crazy this weekend. You, you chose to come in here instead of hanging out out there. I don't know what you were thinking, man. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun in here as well, but we hope you stick around. We got hot dogs afterwards and all kinds of fun stuff. And I'm going to share with you, you know, I get a little nostalgic on weekends like this. When I think of seven years ago, I think about us getting ready to start a church and a school, meeting there. Before that, we had met in our home. And there's a few of you scattered here. Where, where did Kyle Smith go? I saw him around here somewhere. Kyle, you want it right here? Kyle, you were there. One of the first three members of Mercy Road Church right here, Kyle Smith. Yeah. Woo, Kyle. <laughs> uh, got baptized with Christina right over here. And so, you know, it's cool to look back and see where people have come from. The truth is, seven years ago, I was a different person. Kyle was a different person. My wife, we were, we were different. A lot can change in seven years, and a lot will change in the next seven years. The cruisies over there, Jaden was just born when we started this church, man. It's incredible to have the stories to share of all that God does. And if you forget everything else this weekend, I, I just want to share with you, have you ever had somebody trying to talk to you and you don't hear them? I, I don't know if you know this, I'm actually deaf in my right ear. And yeah, most people don't know that. I, you know, I have this hereditary issue. I've had surgery on one of my ears and not the other. And my wife, it's like the worst. She'll be like, Josh, 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 Josh. It has to keep getting louder, right? And then I finally will turn around and pay attention and listen. What I'd like to share with you is I believe no matter where you're at, where you've been, what you're at, uh, doing now, the choices you've made, whether you're a Christian or not, that the God we're going to look at in the Bible today loves you and has been pursuing you and pursuing you and pursuing you and trying to speak to you in your life. I look all the way back, you know, Darren's back there. Hey, Pastor Darren, uh, pa the pub pastor there from WZPL. We got a celebrity with us this weekend. Isn't that great? Uh, you know, back to when we first started the church, Darren used to preach at the school. And I used to see how God actually connected Darren and I on a plane like 12 years ago when I was living in California. Like sometimes you can't plan what God is going to do. And I believe that God has been speaking to you to open yourself up to what he might want to have for you in your life. That's at the heart of what I want to share with you as we finish off a teaching series we've been doing called Compassion. And this week we look at Luke chapter 15 beginning in verse 11. Are you ready to study God's word, church? All right, come on now, put those hands together and welcome those who are attending online. Glad you're all here. Share this online in your sphere of influence. I'm gonna read quickly. Here we go, Luke chapter 15. I'm gonna assume you're at least somewhat familiar with the prodigal son. The story of this guy that was lost and then was found. 20 years ago, I wasn't even a Christian. Seven years ago, my friend Kyle had never been baptized, right? Like, people's lives change. It can change over seven years, over 20 years, or in a moment. I believe that God has already been changing lives this weekend, and he's going to change some of the lives in this room and attending online at different parts of the world right now. In Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 11, it says this. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Jesus is telling a story to his disciples. This is, didn't really happen. He's sharing an analogy to make sense of God's love for you. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country called Las Vegas, <laughs> and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. He took everything, all of his inheritance, everything he'd been trusted with, hopped on a Allegiant flight, <laughs> went to Vegas, hit up the different spots, ran out of everything, made it home, found himself at the Indiana Casino, betting on the ponies, and the next thing you know, he was with nothing, starving, and had to go up to Howard County to work where he would feed the pigs. Any Howard County attendees today? <laughs> I got family from there, baby. Yeah, come on. I, 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 I want to live in the country. I don't, don't, 
to say anything bad about them. But he's living off of, on a farm, feeding pigs, and he's like, I'll eat pig food. Verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. How many of you want to do this with your dad? I, I am no longer worthy to be called your servant or your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. We're getting some new threads for my son. He says, put a ring on his finger. We're going to make him look fancy. Some new kicks on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it because we are having steak tonight. Why? Because for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. That's the story of the prodigal son. We're going to look later on at the older son. But the heavenly father loved his son. Loved him right where he was. The older son will respond in a different way. In fact, if you look at verse 28 with me, it says this in verse 28 of Luke chapter 15. The older brother, when he found out about the calf, became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving over you and have never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when his son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home. And let that sink in for a second. We don't usually say stuff like that at church. But that's where the money went. You would think the older brother had some right to be upset. He says, you killed the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this son, brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. I want to tell you this weekend that holy living is a good thing. It draws you closer to God, reading your Bible, worshiping God on a regular basis, doing all those things. But do not mistake that, that your self-righteousness will ever get you into a right relationship with your perfect God. Only the younger son truly understood what it meant to acknowledge where he was at spiritually. And my hope for us as a church if you forget everything else this weekend, just because you messed up doesn't mean you have to live the rest of your life as a mess up. That we're not just having a seven year celebration this weekend, we are having a prodigal party. We're like, what does prodigal mean? It's like people who have strayed because we are a prodigal church started by people who were prodigals, who worship a God who loves prodigals right where they are. And he's going to run to you with open arms whenever you come home. Will you pray with me? God, we begin this service by acknowledging the presence of your Holy Spirit with us right now. We thank you for the friends and the family that are here with us. There may be somebody who came for the very first time this weekend, a family member, a friend invited them, or they saw something online or drove by the building. God, I believe you may have brought them for such a time as this, this particular time right now to hear this message God, for those of us who have been Christians for a long time, I believe this message is for us as well. Speak right to our souls. We surrender this time to you. Use us, Lord Jesus. We pray this in your name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Have you ever made a really bad decision? Like a type of decision you don't want anybody to know. See, I used to not be a Christian 20 years ago, and I was living in a fraternity house, and there were lots of things I did not want my mom and dad to know. I was embarrassed and ashamed about it. And when I first started admitting what was going on in my life, I had some radical change, and it was very difficult, and it took a lot of courage. And there was, I'll be honest with you, I cried a lot, and I don't cry very often. My wife will tell you that. I'm not an emotional person. But when you have been carrying around a lot of weight of shame and guilt in your life, and you're finally released from it, it's an overwhelming feeling that you and I don't deserve. And I knew I didn't deserve it. You see, in this story, there are two sons. Let me talk about the older son first. He had it going on. He studied well in school. He graduated. He did some apprenticeship. He took over the family business. He stayed home, got up early in the morning, worked hard. 
probably did his daily devotionals and worshiped at church on a regular basis. In fact, he was on the greeting team when you came in the front door. He was an excellent smiler. Every time you walked in, you knew he was just going to be smiling at you. And in the worship services, he stood up at the appropriate times and sat down at the right times. And when we sang songs together, he could actually clap on beat, baby, to every song. The older brother had it going on. And I believe that some of the righteous living draws you closer to God. Unfortunately, this particular individual had a bit of latent self-righteousness he was unaware of. That when his, son, his brother, his younger brother, finally comes home, rather than celebrating that this person has found new life, he gets angry and mad and says, why don't I get mine? While the younger brother, he's the bad kid, right? Like, this is the kid in your family who all of us just, when they're not around, we say, yeah, there was a lot of potential there. They made some choices. They started doing things in high school that they shouldn't have been doing, ingesting things into their body, inhaling things into their lungs. And before long, they found themselves addicted, and they, they took everything they had been entrusted with, this beautiful young life, and they went and wasted it on everything. You, you know the person that I'm talking about. I go home to reunions sometimes, and I'll see people in the small town I grew up in who got addicted to things, and decades later now, they have physical ailments, and their body no longer works the same. And what we secretly do, whether we say it out loud or not, we think in our heads, uh, consequences to your actions. Got what you deserved. That's how we often think, but we don't understand the love that God has for both the older son and the younger son. And his desire that both of them, in humility, will have the courage to approach him. By the way, prodigals aren't just 19-year-olds. I've met plenty of 60-year-old prodigals. People who live their entire life to acquire more things and build their personal empire only to have their wife or their husband leave them, their kids get addicted to alcohol and drugs, and their entire life to become a mess. Because we live for that dream house that we were finally going to get up in the hills to ride around in that car we really want to be seen in. Come on now. And Lord willing to get those season tickets that we have always wanted. Go Irish. They weren't looking so good yesterday, but we got the W. Or maybe it's to get that next achievement in your career, or that next power grab, whether we have to live with integrity or not, or to be beautiful or popular, to be on the cover of a magazine, and we pass down our vanity to our own children and our children's children. That's a throwback, isn't it? How many of you saw every season of Toddlers and Tiaras? Anybody? Okay, I'm the only one? Is that... <laughs> Just kidding, I've never seen the show, but honey boo boo, right? Like, what I want to share with you is all of us fall short. And Jesus knew that, and that's why he did what he did. And his words here in this story is what separates him from the religious Pharisees. That the religious people of Jesus' day, much like today, would have applauded the older brother and talked down and belittled the younger brother. And yet Jesus' love was for both of them. See, if you're taking notes, I'm going to move quickly here in Luke 15. The big idea, three things that all prodigals do. If we're celebrating prodigals, we're having a prodigal party this weekend, celebrating life change, and that's all that's happened in seven years. The hundreds of people that have baptized, the thousands of people that have made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. I want to tell you three things as a church we must do. The first one is this. We must admit our condition if we're good prodigals. Look at verse 17 to 20 again with me. It said this, that... When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. He has the courage then to do this. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. He knew he had messed up. The guilt and the shame of that was just weighing on him, whether he wanted to admit it or not. That when we have strayed and we have fallen and we become complacent in our faith, we've done some bad things, some of us, in our lives. That if someone in this room knew the truth of what we had really done, if our secrets were brought to life, we would be so ashamed and embarrassed, we think our life would be ruined. 
And in order to break through that fear, would you just confess your darkest sin to the person on your right right now? If you'll just turn to your right. No one would do that, would you? Because like when it's in here, I got to hide it. Today is about releasing that, admitting our condition. It would have taken considerable courage for this younger brother to go back home and admit he was wrong and take that humility. Romans 3.23, though, says for all, not some, not just the good people, not just the bad people, but all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We welcome these guys up as they come to help me out here. They didn't seem that excited for you, but I'll do this come up anyway. Uh, we went and found the toughest guys that we could pro possibly find in the church. And when they turned us down, these were the three guys that we found. <laughs> Just kidding. The three of us aren't the biggest men, are we? But they're going to help me out here. Thank you. Nice. Well done. Well done. Some of us, we have been taking this burden of past choices and decisions, and we've laid it on our shoulders and we've been carrying it around for some of us weeks, some of us months, some of us years, or even decades. A past choice or decision or thing that we said, and every time we think of it, we just feel this guilt, this shame, this burden. Every day that younger brother gets up and he feeds those pigs and goes, what have I made of my life? And here's what some of you do. You're better at hiding it than that young man. You just decide, I can carry this. It's not that bad. It's not really a burden in my life. I, still, <laughs> I can still go around, right? And you walk around with this guilt and shame and everybody can see what the problem is in your life. Alcohol isn't a problem for me. It doesn't really affect my life. I'm good. Oh, my marriage is fine. Yeah, we have troubles, but everybody has some burdens. There's nothing really that struggling wrong in our life. And the more we carry it, the more the burden falls on us. We make some choices that we're unproud of, we're ashamed to admit. And the truth is the scriptures teach very clearly Jesus got on the cross so you wouldn't have to keep carrying it for him. And yet we live with this burden, silently affecting our lives on a regular basis. And this young man had the courage to allow it to be released, to be taken home, so that he could finally go back. I'm, I'm going to help you guys out. You look like you're struggling. I'm not going to lie. Uh, last service, Luke Edgerton uh, helped us out, so he must be the real beef on our staff. But... Can we thank them? Well done, guys. Well done. I just want to share with you, you don't have to carry that burden around anymore. But don't, don't keep working, dying on the cross every day when Jesus died for you already. You, you may have messed up, but you don't have to be a mess up. There are stories in the room that I don't have time to share of people who were super far from God and God forever changed their life. And the reason we don't want to share it is because point number three, or excuse me, two, we, we forget and we don't celebrate those who are lost and now are found. And those who are lost, we're afraid that if we acknowledge what's really going on and admit our condition, that we're going to be condemned, just like the older brother did in verses 28 to 32, when he became angry and said, where's mine? This guy's a bad person. And what I want to share with you is this, that today some of us could be released to find freedom, just like this young woman in our church. And I've been waiting to share this video for a while, and it's the perfect time to share it of a young woman who grew up and only knew about the God who would be angry with her for her poor choices and decisions that had his rules and regulations that she had failed. And it was only when she began to learn about the, her Heavenly Father's love for her that it forever changed her life. And she had to make some really tough choices as a young woman. And it brought so much shame and guilt in her life that she didn't know what to do with it. Today, she can stand and worship with us every weekend because of the redemption that she's had through Jesus that she doesn't have to be ashamed or afraid anymore. I want to share Brittany Sundheimer's story with you. Let's watch this four-minute video together. I was raised in a very conservative home. I grew up going to church, um, a small little Baptist church with my whole family, and all of my cousins were there, my aunts and uncles. And in that regard, I really loved it. Um, 
it was a little, it was, it was legalistic. It was, I didn't feel that relational aspect of God. It felt like God was the king and we are his subjects. And if you obey him and you, and you accept his son, you go to heaven. But there was nothing about love. There was nothing about him adoring his children. Um, forgiveness of sin kind of seemed in the background. In comes freshman year of college and a whole taste of freedom that I was not used to. And I forgot, I, I lost my way. My sophomore year of college, I was dating this guy and um, we had actually just broken up when I found out that I was pregnant. And I was terrified. I was devastated. Um, I was mad, but I was scared. I I was so afraid of disappointing my parents. I was so afraid of messing up my life. I didn't want to have a child without a dad. I, I could give you a thousand reasons why I didn't want to keep that baby. And so I, I had an abortion and I didn't tell anybody. I went by myself, carrying that on my own. I became depressed. I cried a lot. I think my parents knew something was going on, but they didn't, they had no idea. Two years later, when I was 22 years old, I got pregnant again. I, uh, I didn't tell my parents, and again, went by myself and, and took care of it. And I was so ashamed, and I was so angry with myself for letting this happen again. Who would do that twice? And it was after another breakup that I just threw my hands up in the air and said, God, like, I need you to be real. And I would dive into my Bible and I would pray sobbing, like asking God to heal my heart, to make me new. And um, I, I wanted him to be good on his promises that he would make me a new person he would forgive me of my sins and, and trade my ashes for beauty and, and he did all of those things and I um, got baptized again, 26 years old and had just been baptized and you know I'm already a weepy mess because I'm just so excited about this new life. My dad gives me this beautiful promise ring and um, it, was, it was just so cool to to see our relationship restored and to know that he had faith in me as well, but I wore that ring until the day that I got married. <laughs> I have a 14-month-old baby, so I've seen redemption play out in so many different ways in my life. I know what hopelessness feels like. I know what it feels like to have disappointed those that you love, but the truth is there's redemption for everyone. There's redemption for you. And the pain of your past is just the beginning of your story. And God wants to use your brokenness to help others find freedom in Him. Can we thank Brittany for sharing her story? Man? <laughs> the pain of your past can be the beginning of your future that you have redemption as well. But it takes us being willing to admit our condition. We have that choice. And then for us to celebrate you in the prodigal stories of life change, just like Brittany. And we hear stories like that, and rather than just focusing on the mistakes made, we get to celebrate that she has found new life in Christ. And it's totally changed her life. And I wanna share that there is forgiveness for you too. You may not have made those choices, You've made other choices, just like this young man in Luke 15 did. And whether you made them, I talked to a woman that said it happened at 49 for me. Just this morning, she shared, 49 is when I made my choices. And this message was for me this week. And I believe for some of you in this room right now, this message is for you. That just because you made past choices doesn't mean there's not redemption for you. But we have to be, number three, unembarrassed of our Father's love.
unembarrassed of our father's love. I got a fourth grader. The best way I could embarrass my son is to wait till he gets on the school bus. I might do this this week. And then just before he gets on the school bus, run out there and give him a big hug and a kiss on the cheek. Love you, son. See you soon. Right? Like, you know, growing up, some of you, you were embarrassed of your mom or your dad and the way that they would behave sometimes for good reason. One time I picked my son up from basketball practice and I didn't want to get his shoes dirty. And he was about six or seven years old. And so I literally picked him up like I did when he was three years old and carried him to the car. And two of his teammates saw it. And we got to the car. He goes, Dad, don't you ever do that again. (laughs) And I feel like some of us, like the child who's embarrassed of their father's love, we're ashamed and we're carrying around all that guilt and that burden and we're afraid to let him release it from us. Don't be embarrassed of your father's love. It's a beautiful thing. And those verses in verses 20 to 24, it said, he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him, and he did what? He ran to his son. Now, if you're not familiar with first century culture, unless you were in battle or in some type of athletic activity, you did not run if you were a man. That was indignant. Your robe or your tunic would fly up, showing your gams off. And men did not do that. But the dad was so happy to see his son who was lost and had come home, who he thought was dead but now was alive. He runs to him. He embraces him. He kisses him. He puts a robe on, a ring on his finger. Get the fattened calf. We're having steak tonight because my son who was dead is now alive. The one who was lost has now been found. Luke 15 begins with Jesus saying, the good shepherd would leave the 99 sheep for the one because that's how much he loves you. Whether you're the good son or the bad son. And we could choose to reject him. We could choose to be self-righteous. We can be afraid and never admit our condition. But he's going to keep pursuing us and pursuing us. The next analogy in Luke 15 talked about the coin that was lost. They stop everything. They sweep the whole house until they find the lost coin. No point in doing anything else until we find it. That's how precious you are to him. And so this dad, representing our heavenly father, and each of us as human beings today, to those when we admit our condition, not only are we going to celebrate that, Your heavenly father is going to bring his unashamed love to you. He's going to welcome you with open arms. But so many of us are afraid. We've heard about this angry God with his rules. And rather than being taught that those were meant to draw us closer to God, we've been taught that God's just going to be upset, angry, smite us, doesn't love us anymore. And so we carry around guilt and shame of our choices all of our lives. This picture of God in the New Testament makes it very clear that is not the God the Bible talks about. The God the Bible talks about will leave anything, be unashamed, unembarrassed to run to you. That's how much he loves you just as you are. That's the great love your father has for you. And I'm reminded of Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. In our last few minutes together, this talks about Jesus and what he's done for you, that you were dead in your sins, in your wrongdoing, and the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made you alive in Christ. When you received the grace of Jesus Christ that you and I never deserved, we're forgiven, and every sin, every wrongdoing is forgotten, not because we're perfect, but because he was. Verse 14, it says, he forgave us all our sins excuse me, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken away, nailing it to the cross and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. It literally says this, that when Jesus got up onto the cross in the New Testament, when he was crucified here, they use this term in verse 14, that our legal indebtedness was paid for. The mistakes that we have made, the reason that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and can't be in the perfect presence of God, it was paid for. Literally, the word there, canceled our legal indebtedness, is where we get the word expunged from. They would literally take a sponge, they would put a solution on the sponge, and they would wipe away the ink of the financial debt that someone had owed. It would be completely erased, forgotten, gone for all time. That's what Jesus did when he paid the price on the cross. 
That's why it says in John chapter 19, when Jesus is dying, he's literally nailed to this, suffocating to death on the cross. And if you've never understood why he's doing that, because for generations, the Hebrew people had sacrificed animals to be forgiven for their mistakes. In fact, on Passover, the day that Jesus was crucified, the high priest would have come out at 3 o'clock in the afternoon after slaying the Passover lamb and said to Telestai, a Greek word, which meant it's paid in full. The sins of the Jewish people were paid for for one year. When John the Baptist calls Jesus the Lamb of God, he's talking about how he would get on the cross as a perfect sacrifice once and for all. And when Jesus gets crucified in John 19, he could have said any word with his last words, but he says, you know what he said? To tell us die. It's paid in full. It is finished. You are forgiven. The legal indebtedness is a race for all time. But you don't know what I've done and where I've been and the hurt I've done, like Brittany shared in her story. Did you read verse 15? The power that Jesus had on the cross disarmed the powers and authority. It made a public spectacle of them. It's like, I know what you did. But this is the power of Jesus. He was up 59 to nothing on the enemy, and he left in the starting quarterback just to run up the score. He says, I know where you've been and what you've done, but if you come home and you admit your condition, you can be released from that. The old can be gone, the new can come. I was once living in a fraternity house doing ungodly things, and I went from this person leading parties to leading Bible studies. And if you would have told me 19 years ago, we would have done this, I said, no, not with me, not with me. If you'd have talked to Brittany six or seven years ago, she said, never, not with me. You don't know where I've been. He canceled the charge. He ran up the score. You were forgiven for all time. And as we close out, I don't want to talk about my, my favorite childhood pet, my dog, Rusty. Anybody grow up with a, a dog as a kid? I know your dog was awesome. My dog was way better than your dog. <laughs> Rusty was this collie as a little kid. I used to ride him around the yard. He was the greatest dog in the world. And he used to run away. And when he'd be gone, we'd be so scared and worried about him. And when he'd get hungry enough, desperate enough, he would finally come home. Now, when Rusty came home to the door, did we look at him and go, bad dog, bad Rusty? No. We started weeping, and we ran to him. And we wrapped our arms around him because he was lost and he had come home. That's what your heavenly father would like to do for you today. He wants to release you of the guilt and shame. He wants to welcome you home. And he just wants to love you in a way no human being ever will. Will you pray with me? God, there are some of us who have been Christians for a while who, if we're honest, our life hasn't reflected what it should. And we've been far from you. And then there are some of us, God, that came into the space this weekend, and we don't know whether we're a Christian yet or not. We've never fully received your mercy on the cross, your grace and forgiveness for us. We've never received your love, God, and we've been carrying around our own cross rather than letting you take it from us because you died on it for us. If that's you in the room, we are going to be unashamed, unembarrassed of our Heavenly Father's love. When we come home, He's going to wrap His loving arms around you. And I know you drank too much, and I know you inhaled some things, and I know you did some things in your relationship that ruined your marriage and ruined your past experiences. But you may have messed up, but you are not a mess up. And what I want to share with you today, that you can be forgiven eternally, spend eternal life with God, and experience Him in your life now. But it takes you admitting your condition so we can all celebrate together. So I'm going to count to three, and if you want to surrender your life fully to Jesus, I'm just going to invite you unashamedly to raise your hand. I'm not going to make you do anything. This is between you and God, but we just want to celebrate as a church. If that's you here today in the room or at your home, I'm going to count to three and then raise it nice and high. One, your heavenly Father never gave up on you. Two, he knows your condition already. Three, admit it to him and raise your hand and say, I give my life to you fully, Jesus. 
As I see those of the four or five of you over here, if somebody can help me out, keep it up nice and high because we want to celebrate with you. These four right here, and it's kind of two or three over there. Just keep it high, and thank you guys for doing that in the back. God, I don't know what's going on in their lives right now, but we know that you're real, you're living, you're active. You don't come to them with judgment. You come to them with love right now and mercy, and they've been unafraid to admit it. May we have more courage like that to share our stories like Brittany did. We love you, God. And these people, may you watch over them, protect them with everything in their life, surround them with just the right people. And I believe that your angels in heaven right now are celebrating. And so we're going to do the very same thing. We give you everything, Jesus. And we pray this in your name. And everybody said, amen.